Welcome. Um, I'm going to spend the next uh, 25 minutes trying to go through a global understanding of what is AMBID. Um, we also refer to this as the core features of AMBID, but I'll have to try to set that in the context as to who AMBID is for. So I've called this talk Reaching Hard to Reach, High Risk, Multi-Problem, Complex Youth. And I suppose the clues in the title, AMBIT is not a single therapy approach for a very closely defined group of young people. In fact, it's the very opposite. If anything, it's a platform upon which a whole range of teams working in different ways with overlapping sets of problems can work out their own way of working with evidence-based practice and um, increasingly, we hope, effectively. But I suppose what we have in common is that the young people that AMBIT was originally designed for are young people who may find it hard to engage, they're hard to reach. They are young people who carry multiple risks um, and um, they often have more than one problem um, which interacts and uh, their, their complexity is therefore partly to do with the mixture of family, social, psychological um, problems that are going on, but also they tend to attract very complex networks of carers. So, one of the things that we've tried to focus on in AMBIT is that it's, um, is this notion of what what's, um, Wenger and uh, Lave, two anthropologists, call communities of practice. So one of the features of AMBIT is that it tries actively to connect up workers in different settings, different kinds of teams, statutory teams, uh, voluntary sector teams, um, who are working with broadly speaking similar types of uh, groups of young people and to help these teams to share some of the best practice and the um, street level innovations that they're coming up with. Uh, in response to perhaps new arising problems, um, but also um, to the different settings that they're in. So there's a range of teams uh, displayed on this slide that um, have all been trained. Um, we've got uh, just over 20 teams around the UK at the moment that have um, received AMBIT training and are more or less actively involved. Because the other point about AMBIT is that there's no such thing as an AMBIT team. We talk about teams that are influenced by AMBIT or build on AMBIT, um, but we're not really interested in um, developing a whole uh, set of uh, teams who are doing exactly the same thing, because our notion would be that what works in uh, City A with a population X might not work quite as well in City B with population Y, uh, even though there will be much that overlaps. So, let's move on. One of the features of complexity in young people is that they tend to uh, emerge into services from a whole, in a whole range of different places. They may show up because of uh, adolescent substance use. They may show up because of offending behaviours. They may show up because they've stopped going to school. They may show up because they've uh, got involved in some violence or falling out of the educational system. Uh, they may show up because they've uh, become uh, part of uh, a, a group of victims or individually become victimised in terms of sexual exploitation. There are many different flags that these young people might pull up their own flagpole to signal actually there's an awful lot going on and going wrong in my life. So very often the service that first picks up these young people may find that um, there are multiple synergistic problems. One problem just makes the next problem more likely uh, and they amplify each other. And we've known this for a long time. In the psychiatric field, we've known that psychiatric comorbidities, co-occurring psychiatric problems as well as drugs, um, are more common than young people who are just using drugs and not having psychiatric problems. Okay. So one of the problems that we found when we first started thinking about this group of young people, heterogeneous but with similarities, 
was that they tend to attract large numbers of workers. Some of the young people that uh, we work with would have a social worker, perhaps a housing officer, a psychotherapist, maybe a family therapist, maybe a psychiatrist as well, maybe a connections worker helping them reintegrate with education, etc., uh, etc., et youth offending uh, officer. So what happens when these young people uh, start to emerge into the, into, into, as, as being sort of a problem for themselves or, or for other people is that out of the very best of intentions they gather around them a, a large network and a network of professionals that have each been trained in a different explanatory model for the problem and often a different model of intervention for that problem. And we call this the sort of Tower of Babel effect um, because it is as if um, just in that very sort of structuring of the care system that, that happens around these young people, they can't help but have an experience that the psychiatrist is talking, you know, maybe about genes, maybe about neurotransmitters and the need for medication, the family therapist is talking about patterns of behaviour, that keep repeating themselves, the psychotherapists maybe from you know the effects of early experience on oversimplifying about everybody but you get the picture um, social workers interested in the effects of deprivation and whether or not the parenting is uh, passing thresholds for concern etc and there's a sense that these young people have that there's a huge network of people around them none of whom appear explicitly to be agreeing with or making sense with necessarily uh, the others, even though individually each, you know, there's no doubt 99.9% of the time are highly well intentioned. So, one of the young people that I remember working with uh, quite a while ago had a poetic turn of phrase, which I'm not going to use entirely on, the, um, on this film, but he said, you know, Dr. Bermington, you know, I think he had five different meetings per week with different workers. He said it's being set upon, it's like being set upon by a flock of starlings. And, and it was a very powerful way of saying that here was a multi-agency network that was highly well-intentioned but had delivered an experience of care that was aversive. So, in thinking about this, one of the features of AMBIT was to try to think about how to make the experience of care different. And that's where the idea of moving from a rather conventional uh, team around the child, where the child's in the middle and they have various specialists who are all bringing their special skills to bear, um, to a worker who has some basic capacities in multiple what we call modalities, ways of working that are driven by different, maybe different explanatory models of how, how the problem came to be. And that what the focus would be on is sustaining a really robust relationship between the worker and the young person and the family. Because mentalising theory suggests very powerfully that it's only when I have an experience that you've really got it, what it's like to be me, to be me, that something in my mind can then open to listen and become interested and to actually learn the socially useful information that you might have to teach me. And that's been described as the pedagogic stance and this relationship has been described as a relationship of epistemic trust. Epistemology is about things from the root of things, the core of things. So it's this experience in a relationship that this person understands me, they mentalise me, that allows my mind to be more open and to focus on what they might have to say that could be of interest and of use to me. Hence, the relationship is very important in Ambit. But equally, the relationship between this multiple, multiply qualified worker to do basic core skills across a number of things, the way that they're supported by the different specialists is equally important. So that mentalising is something that we focus 
on helping the young person and the family to do, but equally that we're interested in supporting and focusing the multimodal worker to do. And one way of making sense that uh, uh, Liz Cracknell particularly has uh, described uh, is that in Ambit the focus of mentalising goes in three directions. We try to mentalise and help to mentalise the young person and family. We try to mentalise our team and our colleagues actively as part of our work. And the third thing is that we try actively to mentalise the wider multi-agency network. So, let's move on and get to the, the core of mentalising. I'm going to speak for a little while to this slide because it's the kind of core of Ambit and we've tried to design a really simple um, layout in this uh, pattern that um, workers might be able to remember the bits, uh, the components of this circle. Uh, and why? Because certainly in the, the, the kind of hurly-burly and the stress of the therapeutic relationship, our own mentalising tends to diminish because it's stressful and certainly speaking for myself it's you know hard to remember anything other than something quite simple. So the idea of this shape that we're going to now populate with with some key words and phrases is that these act like the grab rails in a tube train or a bus so that when the world is really shaking me around I can kind of grab for stuff and help to orientate and uh, uh, support myself in what we would call the ambit stance. So the stance in this diagram is represented by everything that goes on in this grey circle on the outside. And inside are four major areas of practice, which are ways that we actually, you might see on the ground in an ambit team. And all of these elements are held together uh, by this larger conceptual framework, this framework of thinking, which is described by the word of mentalising or mentalisation. So let's work through the stance fairly briefly. The first stance is that we're interested in scaffolding existing relationships. Any therapeutic work with a young person or their family risks the therapist or the helping agency coming in like a knight on in shining armour, being absolutely wonderful and making it all better and then galloping away and leaving the family or the young person bereft. And uh, that is not a sustainable way of working. So the focus needs to always be on looking for the resiliences and the relationships that will exist beyond my brief period of time with this family and this young person um, and looking at how I can strengthen and put a scaffold around relationships that have a chance of holding this young person for the foreseeable future. Now, the second of the stance features we call clinical governance, which is really uh, about the management of risk, uh, doing things properly doing things according to organised systems, trying to be an, a team that learns from experience in, in, in sensible, um, systematised ways. And there's a deliberate reason why both of these are paired and are colour-coded in red. Because each pair of the, these stance elements, to some extent, can be seen as pulling the worker in different directions. Let me explain that a little bit more. If you're scaffolding existing relationships in a young person whose relationships may be with, you know, adults who are not entirely trustworthy, who have a record perhaps of, you know, crime themselves, who may be substance users, who may well have suffered serious deprivation and abuse themselves. If you're trying to scaffold these kinds of relationships because they're the only ones that are there, Inevitably, you're dealing in a world where you know, there are very real risks and there are very difficult judgments to be made about the extent to which you know, this 
will have to be good enough because the alternative, taking this child away, the outcomes for those are pretty difficult and, and are not entirely successful. Um, so in recognition of the fact that when you're working with a real world that is not ideal, clinical governance is the, is the counterweight that says we do need as a team and as individual workers to manage risk in a completely, as Peter Fugel says, completely non-fluffy way. We're very, very serious about that. And the, the way that we negotiate that, the practice that we will describe in a, in a, in a separate talk is what we call active planning, which, if you like, is a mentalised approach to the, to the process of making plans, but making plans that are adaptable enough so that the young person and the family feel, yeah, you know, you get my dilemma. You know, you're not just giving me what you want to give me because you like to give me that. You're giving me something that I've understood and we've agreed that we want. So we might call that collaborative care planning, but there's a little bit more that we want to flesh out about active planning. It works at every level. We want to actively plan really from, you know, the next five minutes when I'm having a conversation with one of my colleagues about a case, I want to know, you know, quickly that he's understood or that she's got what my dilemma is and she can help me solve that and not do something else that might be on his or her mind. So we might actively plan for the next five minutes by being clear about the task. We might actively plan for the next session with a young person by being clear about, you know, what's my goal for this session? It may change because the family or the young person may bring me something completely different, um, but it's helpful to know if I'm on plan or off plan. And we may actively plan in the much longer term, which is what we would conventionally think of as a care plan that sets out what the longer term goals for work is. So that's active planning.